And we are told police recovered more than $300,000 in cash. We counted six guns, including an assault-style weapon and what appears to be a tactical armored vest. We do. You know, we're at the mercy of somebody who really doesn't care about us. I hurt my arm four times, my leg six. I shot like 10 times in, in this leg, three times in my um, right thigh, and three times in my hand. I seen you. a bitch get stabbed, hell the clothes like, and my foot like, how did that affect you? I don't know, it just made me like, I don't know. Used to it. Why is there so much violence in the city? Hatred. Hatred. You know what I'm saying? Uh, jealousy. Envy. Anybody can get it. Anybody in there. Anybody. Everybody. Ain't no exclusion. Ain't no kids excluded. Women. If you get caught in the middle of that, that's just it. With XZs, MMPs, ARs, Draco, SKs, we all open and carry. This way it go down, then the whole St. Louis go down. North side, south side, west side, but it go down right here for real. You can get killed anywhere. You get killed in the county, you get killed downtown, you get killed from the south side, you get killed on the west side, you get killed on the north side. And so, east side, Illinois, across the West Street, little bit. You get killed anywhere. It's bad everywhere, so. These days, to an outsider, St. Louis has become synonymous with murder. It's topped the charts many times in the past decades for both murder and crime. But more intimate knowledge of the city's history paints a picture of two cities in one, Black St. Louis and White St. Louis, and how the murder issue became almost exclusively Black on Black, and the irony of how it stayed that way even after the Ferguson riots and the birth of Black Lives Matter. See, there's two sides to the city, everything south of Del Mar Road and north. The north side is way more active with 70% of murders happening here. It's something of a modern dystopia with the kind of poverty rarely seen everywhere else in America. Combine that with the very loose gun laws, you have a recipe for disaster. Niggas out here, as soon as you get 18, all you need the ID, nigga. And you gonna get you a whole AR-15 or a carbon. I'm the nigga. You feel me? A 18-year-old, no gun license, just... Hey, them niggas leave us. So St. Louis is different. To this day, St. Louis is still one of the most segregated cities in America, with no end in sight. We're going to explore the crime history of the city, particularly how the violence has almost always been connected to race, drugs, and gangs. St. Louis is the story of a city that fell from its former glory. It has a brutal history as well. St. Louis made its come up as a slave trading city in the 1800s, and its home state, Missouri, was also one of the last states to abolish slavery. Later on, it became the main trading post on the Mississippi River and was the fourth biggest city in the U.S., only behind New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, big enough to host the Olympics in 1904. Naturally, all the prosperity attracted poor immigrants and the black population fleeing the torment of the South. A lot of them became stuck in poverty via harsh segregation laws and redlining of early 20th century St. Louis, tailored to be the instrument of their own destruction a story too familiar to America's inner cities. Given the hell they grew up in, these poor neighborhoods birthed all kinds of seedy individuals looking to make an easy dollar. Gangs like the Green Ones, Bottoms Gang, Russo Gang, Hogan Gang, and the Egan Rats were all gangs made up of poor Italian, German, Polish, immigrants that grew up rough. These guys had all the attention of the law enforcement way before black criminality ever became the main focus. These early gangs mainly got money from bootlegging, election fraud, armed robbery, and extortion. Gambling mainly through the numbers game, which was popular with the black folk, was another big earner from them. Bank robbing gangs looted thousands from local banks here and were known to have gun battles live on the street. The bottom gangs would even go out their way to attack St. Louis cops, and they were used by local politicians to enforce their will. It was like the Wild West in these times. The Prohibition presented the next big earning opportunity for local mafias. They would sell Sacramento wine, which was still legal, and smuggle booze from Mexico and Canada. This era was pretty much mobster Game of Thrones, and local bosses were constantly being murdered and replaced. Dominique Giambroni was the OG mob boss in St. Louis until 1924, when his enemies made him flee the city. The Green Ones became the most powerful gang after this. It was a Sicilian gang that put a tax on all the goods sold in Italian communities. The boss was Vito Ginola until he was shot 37 times to death in 1927. 
their main rivals were the Pillow Gang and the Russo Gang. The Pillow Gang was initially led by Pascal Santino, who was also murdered in 1927. Carmelo Fresina took over and was the one that gave the gang the name the Pillow Gang. Named as such because he had to carry a pillow to sit on because he was shot in the ass. The Pillow Gang clicked up with the Russo Gang, which was led by Tony Russo. Years later, they finally joined up into one big mafia family under Thomas Buffer. Buffer fled St. Louis due to the pressure from the cops in 1943, but even he was murdered in Lodi, California in 1947. After that, it became named the Giordano family, after Anthony Giordano, and has held that name ever since. After World War II, the factory started to leave St. Louis and left a lot of people broke and desperate. Many people left and the population dropped from 800,000 to 250,000 in just a few years, most of whom were poor black people that the state didn't care about too much. See, black people had immigrated in large numbers to Missouri during the Great Migration and set up shop in dirty, rat-infested inner-city buildings. So to accommodate for all the new black folks in the city, they built massive projects. The main projects were Pruitt Ego, one of the many super housing projects in America that fell into degeneracy and crime. These 33 buildings of apartments quickly filled up with poverty, drug dealing, and prostitution. They were underfunded, underserviced, and had poor build quality. Raw sewage even flooded the hallways once. Not to mention white flight followed quickly, and the now exclusively black project became ignored by the government. Even police would stay away from the places like these. Many people that grew up here would turn criminal. It was also home to the Spinks brothers, Leon who served Muhammad Ali his first loss, and Michael best known for beating Larry Holmes by being destroyed by Mike Tyson a year later. Other than these two, no one else ever really made it big out of here. Well, not legally at least. Heroin was a big problem in the 60s and 70s. American vets from Nam came home with all types of addictions after the war. But heroin was all the rage. See, a lot of them got addicted during the war. And it was smuggled in all types of ways after. Even in the coffins of dead soldiers. It was the easiest way to make a dollar in the 70s. So a lot of black folk who had no way to touch the American dream took to selling dope. Naturally, Pruitt Ego, the largest PJ in the city, became Heroin HQ. The head of the heroin operation was a man named Terry Joe Cooley. Terry Joe Cooley and his clique had a grip on the heroin market and were making a killing. Dude was a typical 70s kingpin. Fur coats, gorgeous women, mansions, fast cars, the whole thing. But the heroin business had an ugly side. Any opposition or competition was regularly met with death. For a long time, their main rivals were the crew from the Vaughn Projects, and many bodies dropped on both sides. Terry was ambitious and had grand schemes and big plans of expanding. But St. Louis being St. Louis, there were sharks in the water. And someone wanted to take Terry's place. At just 31 years old, Terry Cooley met his death in a grisly way, shot in the head and left to ride in a dark basement. Next to his body, his wife, 10-year-old son and business partner, all shot in the head multiple times. No one knows who did it or why he was killed to this day. Back at Pruitt Ego, Terry was quickly replaced by TJ Ruffin, who was another major player. TJ was perfect for the post as a lifetime criminal and convict. But being the head honcho meant he had a target on his back from the first day on the job. Both the feds and the rivals from Vaughn Projects in January 1972 T.J. Ruffin entered Lily's Tavern, North Sierra. But right behind him, his enemies Fred Parker, Sam, Earl Davis' brothers followed him in. Before they had a chance to off him, T.J. spun around, drew his weapon, and smoked both brothers. But he was hidden in crossfire. He would go on to recover from his wounds, but the feds were building a case against him the whole time. Once he got out, they tracked him down to his girlfriend's apartment. As the story goes, the police pulled up and shots were heard coming from inside the apartment. The cops fired tear gas inside, causing a fire that burned T.J. Ruffin and his girl to death. The autopsy of the bodies revealed they both shot themselves before being burned. By this time, 
Pruitt's ego had been destroyed, but the seat at the top was vacant regardless. Next up was Nate Sledge, another career criminal and a notorious robber and shooter. In and out of jails and suspect of many unsolved gangland murders. In January 1980, Sledge and his homies were approached by several men while they were in a parked car. He must have known who the killers were because they asked him to lower his window before they unloaded into the car. He expired instantly. After Nate came Fast Woods. He was a hardened criminal with over 60 arrests in 22 years of his life. He trafficked heroin to Chicago and India and was being investigated by the IRS for hiding millions. Woods was a loved community hero for helping poor locals, something of a Robin Hood, Pablo Escobar type figure. So the feds had a hard time getting any cooperation from the locals. He had a mark on his head, and the feds and DEA were tirelessly building a case against him. They finally arrested Woods, and he got 30 years for selling heroin. He was 27. Jerry Lewis was a remaining high-ranking member of Pruitt Ego. When most of the OGs and founders were dead or locked up, he was introduced to the gang by his big brother Jimmy Lewis. Jimmy also held rank in the crew and mentored his brother in the kingpin ways. Sadly, Jimmy was killed by a man named Lil Rob right on the city courthouse steps and right in front of Jerry. A sign of the times and how bold criminals were getting. This was retaliation for Jimmy and Earl Williams attempting to rob him. Lil Rob served 14 years for this. At the end of the sentence, he was staying at a halfway house where he was shot three times in the head and killed. He had only been out for two days. Meanwhile, Jerry Lewis had taken over and revived the Pruitt Ego Gang, making millions and making many of the head honchos rich. They lived lavishly with women, cars, showing up to popular fights. Jerry Lewis Bay turned into a Muslim of the Moorish Science Temple during one of his prison stints and cleaned up his act when he got out. He would go on to build political connections with congressmen and mayors as well. Really though, he got in politics as a facade to make it look like he had cleaned up his act. In the 80s, the local police, feds, and DEA were still in the case and they spent millions investigating him and protecting witnesses, a lot of whom kept dying during investigations. The Lewis Bay trial lasted seven and a half months, the longest in Missouri history to this day. He got a life sentence for racketeering and conspiracy to murder, and that was the end of the Pruitt Ego Gang. But after the demolition of the Pruitt Ego in 1972, many of the residents scattered all over the north side and set up new gangs and drug dealing empires all over the city, a pretext for future St. Louis gang wars going on till this day. Dorsey Brandon was born into the crime-infested ghettos of St. Louis in 1973. Dorsey was 6'3 and fearless with an authority complex. Fearless enough that he went by Dorsey on the street instead of taking up a street moniker. Another inner-city youth aptly nicknamed Hitman T was also born around this time. Boys of Destruction were one of the most active gangs. Their rivals were Horseshoe. Both gangs resided in neighborhoods a few streets away from each other. But before all of this, Boys of Destruction and Horseshoe Posse had started out as breakdancing crews. But the breakdancing didn't bring in enough, and they wanted more. Both groups hit their teens right around the time of crack cocaine hitting the streets of St. Louis. Members of the Crips and Bloods from L.A. were setting up shop in the city and set up franchises of their hoods back in L.A. Crack fetched a higher price in St. Louis, too. The new gangs had a lot of influence, on the impressionable kids excited about picking up a side to rip. The Colors movie of 1988 also influenced people a lot, and so did the emergence of gangster rap. Funny enough though, almost all the local crews chose blood. But Dorsey wanted ops, so he turned crib. A new turf war began, and there were constant shootings over turf. BOD turned from a dancing crew to drug pushers full time. They recruited heavily in the rest of St. Louis, Dorsey and Hitman T were top drug dealers, and both became notorious shooters with multiple bodies. The drug lords became the gang bosses. They got everyone paid so everyone respected them. They used kids to do the shootings, take chances on doing prison time on behalf of the older members. They had a gang graffiti like L.A. to mark territory. St. Louis gang eat culture became a thing as well. 
and so did the gang signs. B.O.D. wore St. Louis Blues hats. The Horseshoe Posse wore Indianapolis Colts hats. They tried to mimic L.A. gangs in every facet. They had drive-bys almost every night in St. Louis. And this was a very violent time for the city. At the peak of all the crack-fueled madness, Hitman T was shotgun and often 91. Hitman T was so well-loved that his funeral almost turned into a riot and the cops had to break it up. Word on the street is Dorsey had Hitman T's corpse dug up afterwards. This has never been confirmed. The hatred between crews run so deep and everyone assumed it was Dorsey that did the shooting. He became a major target in the city and he had kept a low profile for some months. Retaliation killings were happening left and right. Many went unsolved. It was one of the bloodiest weekends in St. Louis history. St. Louis descended into war after that, with gang violence skyrocketing and hitting record numbers. The ops tried to burn Hitman T's mom's house to try and kill his family. Dorsey was supposed to lay low but couldn't resist the urge to get back on the street. In October 91, Dorsey was hit seven times in the chest and somehow survived. Despite the second chance at life, Dorsey was shot twice during an altercation outside a club later that year, and it basically opened his wounds up when he died. Boys of Destruction and Horseshoe Posse split into different sets, but the city would never be the same after that. The crack era started to die down in the 90s, mainly due to harsh drug laws and incarceration and murder rates dropped. But as a consequence, it meant a whole generation of boys would grow up fatherless in the unforgiving north side. Another wave of violence was coming. It was only a matter of time. The murder of Michael Brown and acquittal of the officer who killed him sparked a wave of unrest in St. Louis. It was a story all too familiar here. Police brutality with no consequence. St. Louis has always had a tense relationship between the cops and black people here. From planting drugs on people to targeting blacks during the crack epidemic. Like LA 92, the news of the acquittal and the footage of the altercation that led to Michael Brown's demise had people furious. The next few weeks saw mass rioting and looting in scenes that were broadcasted globally. This also birthed the Black Lives Matter movement. This all did nothing to unite the gangs, though. You can do anything in the city because everybody was in Ferguson County at the time fucking it up. So you can go downtown and kill your enemy, go kill your enemy on the west side. Police ain't coming because all the fucking police is in Ferguson. You can straight rob everything in the city right now or kill anybody you want to kill because everybody was in Ferguson at the time. In the aftermath, the relationship the black community has with the cops in Ferguson and St. Louis changed forever. All in all, though, I seen the police scared, and that's, that's like, that was a scary feeling and a, a positive feeling at the same time, to just be able to ride past the police and just see them put their head down. I never experienced that. I've always seen the police see me, and they mug me until I put my head down, but to ride past them and straight see how shook they was, and I think that really did something for the people. In the 90s and 2000s, mainstream rap culture started bringing attention to the inner city black people too. And major cities had people rep them, but St. Louis never really had anyone. Cities like New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Houston, and Memphis had major rap scenes. And this gave an avenue for impoverished kids to find success and escape the hood. St. Louis, on the other hand, only saw Nelly make it big. A few others like Chingy, Jaquan, and Huey came and went, but never became mainstays in the culture. For inner city blacks, the blueprints of success has for decades been rap or go to the league. So for anyone that's not six foot seven or athletically gifted, this usually means the former. The birth of drill music in nearby Chicago sparked the resurgence of gangster rap themes and hip hop music. Lacing the most hateful and disrespectful lyrics on a beat has never been more popular. It hit St. Louis like a storm, and the hip-hop scene here evolved towards catering to similar themes as Chicago rappers. St. Louis rap scene went from this to this. Though not many of these rappers from the newer generation have made it mainstream, say for Metro Boomin, Smino, and Comethazine, a few of them still do decent numbers on YouTube and have built a lot of clout in their city. By nature, the drill scene thrives off of bragging about devious deeds taunting rivals and bragging about smoking such and such. 
which is akin to blatantly snitching on yourself. The feds using lyrics to build cases is only getting more common now. Not to say there's not a whole lot of artists trying to make positive or motivational music, but the allure and the intrigue to drill rap and hearing about who shot who and who was smoking on what means drill does way bigger numbers than the positive stuff. Given most of these guys are part-time hustlers and street dudes, this means your new favorite rapper is always at risk of becoming another murder statistic. On the ground, the old color line disappeared. And even Bloods and Crips get along in St. Louis hoods. Like, ain't no, like this ain't, this ain't gang with a, this ain't organized gang. This ain't organized crime. This ain't no, ain't nobody, ain't no OG, ain't no big bro, ain't no, like it's a, it's a Crip, Blood, GD from the east side, and a motherfucking Vice Lord all in one court right now. It ain't about no color over here. Okay. It's about what you standing on your hood, for real. The beef is now between sets. Sadly, there's no end in sight. So that's St. Louis, and why it's the murder capital of the U.S. Segregation, drugs, gangs, and drill music. But who's to blame here exactly? You decide.